For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to the Gist on Strat News Global. I am Surya Gangadharan and this evening we are going to focus on defense exports that are being talked about in the media and uh, which the political leadership has made a big uh, a buzz about. Um, as you're aware, uh, India's exports of military hardware currently is around 8,400 crore or a little over a billion dollars. The plan is to increase it to $5 billion or 35,000 crore in, by 2025, which is about three years from now. So um, there are a number of uh, measures the uh, recent budget announced for uh, boosting defense exports. Among them, let me just play a small graphic for you. 25% uh, of the defense ministry's R&D budget, uh, the research and development budget, goes for private industry. Uh, private industry will be encouraged to design and develop military equipment. A nodal umbrella body will carry your testing and certifying of military equipment. And a list of over 2,800 items cannot be imported. So that's the uh, some of the takeaways from the uh, recent budget. So industry is pleased with the budget um, uh, measures. And I have with me uh, Lieutenant General Vinod Khandare. He was a military advisor in the National Security Council Secretariat until recently. And uh, General, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. A pleasure being with you. So this target of uh, $5 billion, we have about three years to uh, reach that target. Is this feasible? Is it realistic given that, uh, you know, the process of uh, defense procurement, uh, the various reforms initiated are only now beginning to take off? Yes, it is realistic. In fact, the target had been laid down by the prime minister uh, during his first term also. And... Uh, the reforms in the defense procurement or the manufacturing sector, uh, it had actually started uh, well before uh, the COVID hit us. There has been a slight bit of, a, uh, say, slowing down because of the COVID. But I think uh, once the prime minister has given a goal of $5 billion worth of exports and which is linked to the $5 trillion economy mark uh, for the country, uh, we need to get our act right, and in that, it has to be a team effort. And when I'm saying team effort, let's start with the users identifying what products they want, what is it that they are importing, and is there a particular level of readiness within the country, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector, whether the research projects are fructifying, and how fast can they be brought into the production and thereafter the usage, I think uh, the maximum time that gets spent is in the delays that occur possibly in the processes and the decision making and also the efficiency in the production sector, more so in the public sector. I think if uh, everyone gets their act right, uh, we should be able to reach that. But it's a tall order. I definitely agree to that. But if we can reach where we have reached from 2014, that is from just about 2,000 uh, crore worth to about 9,000 crore worth, uh, I think we should be able to uh, come closer to that 5 billion mark. Mm -hmm. So um, what are the markets we are looking at? I presume Africa is, uh, is a potential market for us. You know, the markets are also dependent on... Uh, how a foreign policy looks at countries. Uh, you know, the easiest for the business world would be to sell uh, military hardware in those areas where conflict is going on. So <laughs> certain items which can be rapidly used are the arms and ammunition, communication equipment. Uh, but the big ticket items, say, for example, the uh, light combat aircraft or helicopters, or ships, uh, they would not necessarily always be employed in the uh, current conflict zones. So there are countries which want to change their inventory. 
where the big ticket items would be there there would be some countries which would be wanting to achieve the deterrence level where these missiles uh, would possibly come into play uh, there are countries which are struggling in the maritime domain to control the piracy uh, there these fast attack crafts offshore patrol vessels would happen uh, so i don't think we should be looking at any particular continent as such but there is a wide market available and each of these segments have to be touched starting from the lowest possible technology level of say a hand grenade to the highest level where we are talking about missiles and fighter aircrafts mm -hmm. and uh, what about asia is asia um, we've recently sold the brahmos missile for the first time um, to uh, the philippines uh, is asia then uh, a potential market yes uh, asia definitely the southeast asian countries uh, definitely is a potential market actually surya what happens is uh, there are countries which have the capacity to buy there are countries who have the willingness to take the defense line of credit and there are countries which possibly look at grants so we have a mixed bouquet you know when we have to increase the defense exports we have to look at all these three and then there are ways and measures of encouraging this whether you empower your defense attaches you sensitize the ambassadors you deploy your training teams which can definitely convey what kind of arms and equipment you use which would be suitable to them so whether these are asian countries whether these are african countries and then there is a private sector giving components for the bigger products which are being assembled elsewhere in the world so even that is a segment so while we only focus on say brahmos for philippines uh, that's one big ticket definitely but there are many more smaller components which add to the defense exports mm -hmm. and um, when we look at uh, you mentioned the lca it's currently in singapore uh, apparently oh. hindustan aeronautics is also pitching for a potential malaysian order now when um, the lca has yet to enter the indian air force in sufficient numbers is this the right time to go about pitching for exporting this aircraft uh, definitely surya you know what uh, every nation which wants indian equipment they they want an assurance that it is already introduced into the indian armed forces now uh, more often than not you hear the manufacturer saying that look i am going to take this much time if we really have to get into serious business of exports and where the timelines have to be uh, compressed i think it's high time that the industry also starts looking at more than one shift uh, there are certain places where i have seen two shifts are running but when you are looking at an economic race there is nothing wrong in looking at three shifts and compressing the timelines and also please remember when we compress the timelines you are still within that technology curve where you will be able to sell your stuff but if you extend the timelines because your production is going out at a one shift per day then by the time you are delivering the last lot or the second lot you are already out of the technology curve and somebody else will jump in and say look i am going to give you something and then there are the inflationary costs there are the cost overruns the delays also uh, bring in inflationary pricing uh, i think what we need to do is to compress timelines even if we have to go for faster production and by doing that we will meet our own requirement as well as the defense export whether it is malaysia or any other country for that matter mm -hmm. you really think um, agencies like uh... maybe uh, the drdo hindustan aeronautics so many others uh, are they really up to this uh, challenge uh, what is being done to ensure they are able to you know uh, raise their level of uh, uh, their ability to work research produce outcomes uh, the drdo uh, the hindustan aeronautics limited the shipyards the ordnance factory boards the various dpsus that we have these are the most important stakeholders and that is in the public sector drdo in particular is important because of the sensitive kind of research that they have to do mm -hmm. uh, i think uh, uh, one of the issues which was always said was that they need uh, 
continuity in leadership you look yes. at the chairman he's been given extension so there is a continuity which the government has given him uh, there is a lot of sensitization that is required for improving the output of the laboratories so i think that there again the government has focused correctly to uh, maybe uh, lead them ahead and get them to produce much more at least the research part they must do much more and they have to do it on a faster timeline uh, the second part is about the hl yes they need to again get their uh, act right and speed up uh, speeding up is what they have to do and one of the thing which i told you is uh, more shifts so even if the assembly line is uh, one or less uh, maybe two or one in whichever manner they have to use that assembly line uh, all 24 hours same is the case with the ordnance factory and the dpsus if they were not there up till now uh, there is no reason for them not to be there for the future in fact uh, since you mentioned that we are rather late in this game isn't it we could have done it 30 years ago in fact we got a lead uh, right from the time we became independent in 1947 yeah. uh, all the ordnance factories were here pakistan didn't have a single ordnance factory so yeah. we had the uh, setup and then we expanded it further so the british left us with the entire setup of ordnance factory thereafter uh, we didn't stop there we went in for the dpsus we went in for a number of psus <clears throat> unfortunately what happened was the kind of work culture that got set in there is not commercially competitive globally or even regionally for that matter so it's uh, maybe if you say that uh, we are a little late maybe it's a little late in identifying where the problem is lying but otherwise the assets were always with us there was yeah. uh, assurance from the government there was a kind of patronage from the government you look at the public private sector comparison and you realize uh, that the cost to the country is much higher when it comes to the public sector as related to the private sector so maybe we are late in identifying that uh, this is the sector which needs a push which needs leadership which needs setting up goals and accountability that may be the reason but otherwise assets wise i don't think we had ever a problem mm-hmm. uh who do you say are our main uh, are our competitors here i mean i know i'm not even looking at the western companies european or the us you know but otherwise there are a lot of middle level producer even pakistan i think does a better job than us yes pakistan uh, went in for establishing these ordnance factories 14 of them and then they possibly learned from us also and they had the advantage of uh, a lot of uh, funding lot of technology coming from the west uh, they were to a large extent patronized by the americans and a uh, lot of technology came to them lot of uh, funding also came to them for various reasons for geopolitical and geo strategic reasons that they became the preferred partner we went in for some kind of a socialist model where we were quite content the way we were doing which is obviously not going to stand us in good stead but uh, who are the uh, competitors you know currently we may be saying that we are among the first 25 or maybe our ranking is 23rd in uh, leading exporters of defense product uh, that doesn't go well of a country of our size we have to pick and choose our competitors and you really uh, touch this point very correctly you know whenever we've been speaking to people from the dpsus or from the ordnance factories we've been telling them whom are you competing against don't show us what you did in the last quarter or last year uh, that's not uh, standing you in global competition tell us what has china done or what has pakistan done in the last quarter in the last year and wh- where have you pitched yourself so choosing the right kind of a competitor will get the best out of the country i think there uh, we need to do much better otherwise uh, we we can say that uh, okay this percentage wise we've done this um, the amount we have done is much better but the performance and per capita you you look at um, the dpsus and the ordnance factory board uh, their output for exports is just 2% of their revenue so is is that good enough it's definitely not good enough if they are going to talk in terms of um, say 
a thousand crore or two thousand crore worth of exports, which is their contribution. Uh, to run the ordnance factory, the government pitches in about thirteen to fourteen thousand crores per year. So yeah. I think that's uh, yeah. what has to be realistically looked at. Mm -hmm. So you, would you would you um, is it your view that uh, the push should be more towards the private sector, gradually building up capabilities and capacities there? In any case, private sector is a major contributor to our exports today, and uh, uh, they have done that uh, mostly in the global market they have been giving components to even those countries which are well ahead of uh, ahead of us in the uh, defense production and exports you you look at uh, there are many companies here in india which are manufacturing components which are taken away by united states or by israel or by france and then they assemble all that and thereafter we are buying the same thing <laughs> at a very hefty price. Yeah. So if the components can be manufactured here at a reasonable price, I think we'll have to be more liberal toward the private sector and say, okay, the licensing part will have to be simplified. Like I know of a particular a few companies which manufacture uh, the lowest technology, if I'm going to say, is the small arms. So. They manufacture parts which are sent to the countries I mentioned. Then they assemble them and then they sell them back to uh, various <laughs> countries. So let's go in for uh, liberalizing the kind of licensing. And uh, when I'm saying liberalizing, it really hurts or pinches a private player. Uh, he has to spend uh, a long time having applied. While we are going ahead with speeding up the processes, much more is needed. So, say um, five years down the line, uh, how would you see the Indian uh, defense uh, ecosystem, you know, uh, whether in terms of uh, manufacturing or exports? What is it that you would envisage? Uh, because the uh, private sector and public sector now both are competing fiercely because there is a goal given by the prime minister. Uh, and this kind of uh, firmness of the political will has to be exerted, then these five years can be quite productive. You see the kind of focus that the government has given. You know, one is the manufacturing part. The second is uh, getting to the market. Now, earlier what used to happen is uh, we expected people to come to us and ask us, what do you have to give? <laughs> uh, now you have the ambassadors and the high commissioners of uh, our uh, IFS lot who are quite sensitive. They know that they have to deliver by promoting the defense exports. They have been now actively engaged. And the moment the ambassador and the high commissioner are focused on that, the defense attaches are also focused. The defense attaches uh, did not have the kind of monetary support earlier. Now the government has uh, given them kind of monetary support to organize events and promote what we have. There is one thing more, which in the next five years, if we are able to do, we deploy more number of training teams abroad because the training team is the one which will actually explain how a particular Indian equipment is better than the equipment which they are buying from other countries. Mm -hmm. Unless we get our people on ground, uh, I don't think uh, the defense attaches and the ambassadors will be able to fill up this gap because the training team is dealing with the practitioner in that particular country who's going to hold that equipment or utilize that equipment. I think one good way would be to promote the uh, training teams also and get in more and more of those uh, friendly foreign countries or the uh, customers to come and visit our establishments. And when they visit our establishments, let's better be globally uh, uh, appearance-wise and productivity-wise something which attracts them. You know, there have been instances where uh, some foreign delegations have come and they were quite disgusted visiting the production facilities and they went and immediately said, no, no, we are going to go to some other country. And there are many a country which are ready to uh, provide these facilities, whether it's China, whether it's Turkey whether it's the European, the East European countries, the West is always there. So I think we, in the next five years, if we have to do it, 
each one will have to limber up that is starting from the person who's on to a lath machine or filling ammunition or filling propellant right from there to the person who's taking the decision so the last question i noticed that um, uh, some of these uh, credit lines were given to certain countries you know for buying indian military equipment they remain unutilized bangladesh for instance they haven't uh, bought anything and there is some buzz in the media about uh, bangladesh looking at uh, you know the typhoon aircraft in the in europe for its air force i mean um, i presume the neighborhood is a major uh, focus of our uh, export uh, push yes the government uh, was actually looking at the neighborhood very seriously right from the time it came into place and it's not only about defense production but other engagements also and uh, when you mention specifically bangladesh i want to tell you bangladesh a large portion of its inventory uh, is now based on china but uh, mm. last couple of years i would say they seem to be diversifying their inventory whether they have to get something from europe whether they have to get something from turkey uh, so they are diversifying so to that extent Uh, they are looking at typhoon they are looking at rafale they are looking at any kind of aircraft or any equipment which will diversify i think very intelligently they are doing it uh, someone can adversely comment and say that you know you will have a large inventory of diverse kind of uh, countries of origin which means yeah. the logistical part will become much more difficult that is a counter argument to that but uh, why have we not been able to do i already told you that we have to get things right now the lines of credit uh, there's no one single reason as to why they are lying unutilized or underutilized my personal experience has been that we promise them a line of credit but then to get them to accept uh, a plain paper or tick box approach will not appro- will not uh, succeed you have to do much more understanding the sensitivities and the way those governments function at times everything over the table is also not functional yeah mm-hmm. so lots of issues there general khandari we are completely out of time but it's been a fascinating discussion uh, thank you very much sir and um, uh, great perspective I, ho- i only hope that we are able to reach that uh, 5 billion dollar target in the next 3 years thanks again very much Thank you Surya we also hope pray and we will also put our shoulder to the wheel to ensure that the country moves faster than what we have planned thank you so much thank you sir and for all of you out there who have been following this discussion uh, keep coming to us with your comments observations and questions we welcome them uh, subscribe to our youtube channel and uh, follow us on social media twitter instagram uh, and the others uh, thank you very much good night